Is that a fact or a myth? Only. Uh, vegetables, meats, and most mixtures of foods should be canned only in a pressure can. Oh. 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 All right, next one. Canning in your oven is a safe, convenient way to seal jars. I'll go over the answers in a second, so just be thinking. You can invent your own salsa recipe and can it as long as you put, process it in a water bath canner. Don't cheat. All right, another one for you. Acid, such as lemon juice or citric acid, should be added to all tomatoes prior to canning. See some good answers on here. All right, I'm going to give you a couple more. Most vegetables do not require heat blanching prior to freezing. So before you freeze them, do you have to blanch them? Okay. All right. This is the last one I'll give you. There are a few more, but I'll give you one more because we're going to get started soon. You can expect high quality food when you freeze foods in plastic containers that previously held whipped topping or margarine. I know we've all done it, or at least our grandparents have done it. We don't think those are airtight, but we have done it, haven't we? <laughs> All right, let's see. I'm gonna see if there's any other good ones to give y'all while everybody's getting settled here. All right, here's one. Pickles are so acidic that they do not need to be processed in a boiling water bath canner. Okay. It's a fault, isn't it? All right. Y'all are thinking on the right path here. Yep. You want to use the yeah. microphone? All right. I am going to actually, you want to hand it to me real quick so I can. Yeah. Yep. All right, everybody. If you're still taking the quiz, um, you can keep doing that. But I think everybody's pretty much done guessing. Um, these would definitely be guesses for me, which is why I'm not teaching this class. Uh, I am going to introduce Patsy Watkins. She's been with the Extension for. Uh, well, this particular part, 11 years. 11 years, and this is her retirement year. She is retiring in August, and so we will be sad to have her leave us, but luckily we could get her to stay on to help us with this class. And so she is our extraordinaire on food saving. So if you have questions about that, this is what we're hoping to answer today. She's going to be going over these facts or myths. She's going to be talking a little bit about not just canning, because there are many different ways to save and preserve your harvest other than just canning. It's not the only way, and sometimes it's not even the best way to preserve foods. So we're going to go through that, and Patsy, anything else you want to know about yourself? No. She's a Tennessee resident. Yep, born and bred. Born and bred in? Trialstill County. Trialstill County. County. So if you know where that is, that's where she's from, not too far from here. All right, Patsy, I'm going to hand it over to you, and we're going to get started on the facts or myths. Not a native we came, but I have been here almost 42 years. So it's pretty, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, but still not native. Okay, we're going to go with these facts and myths, okay? Because this is, you know, they're like you said, well, your mama did it. Might be right, might not be right, okay? Uh, old church cookbooks have great canning recipes you will want to use. What do y'all think? Yeah. It's a myth. It's a myth, okay? 
because a lot of those old church cookbook recipes, they're not tested. And that's what we're going to talk about with canning. You definitely want to use a tested recipe. Some of this stuff we'll touch on maybe more than once as we go through it. But one of the things I want you guys to know about canning, people nowadays tend to think canning is an art, okay? They kind of like to think, you know, I'm really a great homemaker. I'm getting back to nature, and I'm going to can. And they just, you know, you see all these blogs and everything else about it, but canning is a science. And it's very precise. And if you don't do it right, you can kill yourself, okay, or your family. So don't think of it as an art. Think of it as a science, okay? So that's why we don't want to look at those old church cookbooks. And that's why Great Grandma's recipe, although you may think it's great, if it doesn't line up with the tested recipe, then you don't do it, okay? You just make it needed, okay? Fact or myth, as long as you boil the jars of canned vegetables long enough, you will have a safe end product. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. There is a time that you're supposed to process those canned foods. And again, that has been tested to make sure that all the microorganisms will be killed and that you will have a safe product. And depending on, you know, there's a lot of factors in that time. And it can be how much is in the jar. It can be the thickness of your vegetables or your fruit or whatever it is. You know, there's just a lot of factors in that. Factor myth, vegetables, meats, and most mixtures of food should be canned only in a pressure canner. Myth, okay. Uh, vegetables, meats, and mixtures of foods. Now, know that it's a fact. They are supposed to all be in a pressure canner. It's not a myth. Uh, the reason being, and we'll explain the difference between water bath canning and pressure canning. Pressure canning is for those low acidic foods. Your vegetables are low acidic, almost all of them. Um, and we'll discuss tomatoes in just a minute about that. And uh, meats are very low acidic. And then your mixtures, because you don't always know, we do those in a pressure canner because they're safer. It gets a lot higher temperature than in a water bath, okay? You can invent your own salsa recipe and can it as long as you process it in a water bath can. Oh, did I miss number four? Oh, sorry. Canning in your oven is safe, convenient way to seal jars. What do you think? Just to seal the jar? No. No. It's just sealing the jar does not make it safe. Well, that's what they ask. Is it safe to seal the jars? Is it safe, though? Oh, yeah, not safe. It's, it might be convenient, but it is safe. <laughs> okay. So you don't can it in your oven. You know, have you heard that myth? Have you also heard about canning in your dishwasher? Yeah. 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 yeah well, that one's not good either. <laughs> yeah. Same place you wash your tennis shoes, you can can your vegetables. I don't know. Your, your ball caps mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. I mean, like, really? Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Okay. Uh, okay. Back to inventing your own salsa recipe. Would you invent your own salsa recipe? No, it needs to be tested. Okay. It needs to be tested. Okay. Acids such as lemon juice or citric acid should be added to all tomatoes prior to canning. Aren't they already acidic? That is a fact. Wow. Yeah, and that is a big one that people don't get because, and I'm sure Taylor can explain this to you as well, and it may be more in depth than I do. Tomatoes are right there on the middle of the line about being acid, being acidic, and being, you know, non acidic. <clears throat> so they're right there at that 4.6. Okay, so some of them are a little more acidic, some of them are a little less. But there are a whole lot of factors that affect that the growing season, the soil, the rain, the sun, water content, mostly. water content, just a whole bunch of things. And the thing about it is now people say, oh, heirloom tomatoes are more acidic. No, not necessarily. And, and they even did, we read a study in one of the classes I took on this, that they studied all these different tomatoes, okay? And even from the same plant, the pH was different on all the tomatoes. So therefore, to assure, to ensure that they are acidic enough, you always add a little tomato juice or a little citric acid if you're going to water back. Now, if you don't want to do that, you can pressure can them and treat them like they are a low acid food, and that would be safe, okay? But a lot of people are more comfortable with water bath canning than they are pressure canning, okay? So there's where we go with that, okay? 
Most vegetables do not require heat blanching prior to food. That's a myth. You need to blanch your vegetables before you freeze them. And that's because it is that quick stop, stop the process of deterioration right there. And quick blanch, stop that, and then you can freeze them. It's like flash freezing kind of things, okay? And you can read more about that on the back of those things, okay? You can expect high quality food when you freeze foods in plastic containers that previously held whipped topping or margarine. You know, that is a myth. You know, those plastic tubs are not going to be, they're not going to hold up in the freezer. Uh, actually, you probably shouldn't use those for storage of anything except maybe, you know, random things you find around your house or something, not food and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, you can use glass mayonnaise jars to can foods such as peach, peach sauce in a boiling water bath can. That's a myth. You need to use jars specifically for canning. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Paraffin wax provides an excellent seal on jelly and jam jars. That's a myth. You've probably seen your mamas and grandmamas do that back in the day. Yeah, they used to do that, definitely. They used to, you know, you get that jelly and then you pour that hot paraffin on and you hope you didn't spill it on something because it would burn you really bad and all. But they have found that it's not safe. Even though it's sealed, it leaves a little bit of air. And a lot of times you dig that paraffin out and it'd be a little layer of mold on the top. Yeah. So that is not safe anymore. I did have a lady last year wanting to talk about that in ring the fair because we said we don't accept that. And she goes, well, that's the way I learned to can in India. And I said, well, ma'am, that's not acceptable here in the United States. And we don't do that anymore. And, you know, maybe, you know, so anyway, we couldn't accept it. So some other countries still do it, but it's still not so. After mint, pickles are so acidic that they do not need to be processed in a boiling water bath can. That's a myth. You need to, they're acidic because you pickle them, but they've got to be in a water bath can or after. Screw bands should be tightened, fingertip tight prior to canning. That's fact. You don't want to give them too tight. You just want to give them fingertip tight. Okay, so I'll get a good job on that. All right. Get on the back. I hope our uh, folks at home did a good job on that as well. What was number three? Oh, y'all were talking about how you got. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about give me some reasons why we might preserve food. Again, yeah, you've got an excess on it. Yeah, that's why you might preserve it. That's one way. What's another reason? For the winter? Hard times. Hard times, okay. Or to sell. Or to sell, okay. What else? What about just liking it when it's not in season? Is that for the winter, I guess? You know, you can't get green beans in the winter. So you freeze them or can them or whatever. You know, that's one reason. Um, what about um, creating some specialty foods that maybe you couldn't buy, like jelly, relish, things like that, that you think would taste better than in the store, maybe? Okay. Um, what do you think about reducing food waste? Do you think it reduces food waste? Yeah, you don't want to waste it. Okay. Um, another thing is just maybe it might be rewarding. It might make you feel good that you did something, right? Now, there's various opinions about that. Some people don't think it's rewarding at all. And other people, they think it's a lot of hard work. And other people think it's very rewarding. But again, remember, in that rewarding, it's still a science. It's not an art, okay? So it's not all about that. Okay, so what are some of the costs that go with preserving your food? Think about that. Yeah, all the equipment for canning, okay? What else might go with it? Containers, jars. Because jars are expensive. Yeah, is there are. cost even with freezing? Yeah, there is. Because one, uh, you would need a freezer, right? And then would there be the electricity and energy to run the freezer? Yeah. Even with your canning, not only all this equipment you're looking at in your jars, but then the energy you're using on your stove to get it that hot, okay? There's energy costs with food preservation. Uh, what about your food? 
it's a little less expensive if you're growing it, right? Even though there are some costs to growing it, correct? Mm -hmm. Fertilizer, soil, you know, if you don't. Yeah. You hear all the time. I spent, you know, a hundred dollars to, you know, grow a eighty cent tomato, but right, yeah, hundred dollars to get an eighty cent <laughs> tomato. Okay, yeah, I think we spent twenty dollars one time and got on some plants and got four tomatoes, so we yeah. figured out they were five dollars a piece, you know? <laughs> and they weren't big ones either. Okay, uh, ours got the lights. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, then there's also um, you saw that your time and effort. Can you just go in there real quick and okay, I've got all these excess tomatoes. I've got an extra hour. I'll get them, you know, preserved, right? No. And, yeah, it take you a whole weekend. And I'll, I'll tell you a story about that. I had a man call me once and he was talking about he went to farmer's market and he was talking about all these green beans he had. He goes, I ran out of time. And this was Tuesday. And he said, you know, they're in my crisper. Are they going to be okay if I wait till Friday? And I go, well, you know, they will preserve at whatever state they're in, the quality where they are at that moment. And I said, they're deteriorating every day. And, you know, he was just really upset that I couldn't bless his green beans and they were going to be okay by Friday. And uh, and he goes, that's just ran out of time. You know, this takes a lot of time. I said, yes, sir, it does. And that's what you need to think about before you get to the farmer's market and you get all excited and you buy bushels of all these things and then you don't have time to do it. And that's the same thing, even though you're probably going to be growing your own produce, because this is the farming fundamentals, um, you still need to realize that, that your time is precious and limited. And unfortunately, a lot of this produce all comes in at the same time in that right table. Yeah, it, it doesn't go like, okay, well, this week we'll do green beans, and oh, this week it'll be the squash, and this week it'll be the cucumbers. You know, they just, it just doesn't work like that. So what you need to do is kind of have a plan, okay? And there's several plans. Y'all give me some ideas of some plans. Yes, ma'am. I'm a big fan of Okay. What I do is I just set aside, you know, one or two weekends every month in the summer, and uh -huh. when things are going to come in big. Um, my CSA. And so I just basically schedule a whole Saturday and spend the whole day planning. Oh, okay. It's very worthwhile. Good. Mm -hmm. well, did y'all hear what she said? She sets aside time knowing when she's going to get the most. Okay. Yes. Uh, I would put in for time off work you know, on my day job so I can focus on getting the harvest in and preserving okay. it. Okay. Well, that's, that's a plan too. Yes. I know what doing our garden i don't do the succession planting so that everything will come in at the same time so that i only have to dedicate a day or two to painting like just one okay so you kind of have it planned out in your garden okay that's a good plan yeah, that's, that's nice good. that way you're not like waiting to have enough to can you're like yeah. holding it and it's rotting and you're like a little bit yeah. each week and you know getting all that stuff out for two yards okay yeah. what, what else anybody else have any other ideas well, you know, one idea is if you have a lot, you might can sell it somewhere. Uh, have you thought about gifting or donating it? You know, neighbors really appreciate extra produce, okay? And they may give something back to you in the form of however they used it, or they may give you cookies later or something, or they may share something extra they have with you. That's one thing you can do is gift it. Uh, sometimes churches have what they call share tables, and people just bring what they have to share, and those who don't have can take, and that's one thing. Uh, Graceworks and other uh, places around here often will take excess produce for those who do not have any food, you know, and they will put it in their bags for that week. So there are some options that you can do with it rather than just letting it go bad. Or you can throw a big party and invite all your family and all your neighbors and friends and y'all can all do it together or cook a big thing or whatever you're going to do, depending on what it is. I saw a video of this family that does, they have, every year they have a pesto day. <laughs> and so it's like all the women of the family come and they make jars and jars of pesto together. Wow. And that's like their annual event is I forget, they call it something more fun than pesto day, but it was something along those lines, pesto party or something like that. Anyways, and they all just got together and everybody had their own job and they made light work of it. And yeah. then they had pesto. And it does make it a lot more fun when you're doing things like that together. In fact, um, seems like a million years ago, but um, in Australia, they had a pesto day. Oh, really? Yeah, 
I guess probably fairly early in my marriage. I think I did have one child. Um, fun fact, I have six kids. So when I have to date my wife, if I have many kids, I have to date my wife. So that's why it seems like it was a really long like, time ago. I've only really had one child. But um, my dad was still alive and he was a farmer. I did grow up on a farm, even though I'm not an animal person. But um, I did grow up on a farm and my, um, my dad had a garden. And so they would bring food to us. My husband and I were living here. We became city. We were city folks. And uh, but my husband was a gentleman weekend farmer. He would go up there and farm on the weekend. And so it seemed like there was a bunch of cabbage. And I grew up being a freezer person, uh, much more than a canning person. So I do remember a weekend, like you said, my mom coming down, and we made freezer slaw with cabbage. Now, you can imagine all the grating and shredding and all that goes in and vinegar and all that stuff that went in to make all this freezer slaw. And uh, it seems like, and I remember the end of the day, we were just like covered from head to toe in cabbage. Sure, you smelled really good. Yeah, we smelled really good, you know. <laughs> but we laughed and had fun, and we got a whole lot accomplished. And, of course, the reward at the end was that my husband took us out to eat because, you know, we obviously couldn't cook dinner. I mean, could you possibly cook dinner after you've done all that? So, yeah, have a party if you have a lot of stuff because it does make it more fun. Okay. Well, let's go on and talk some more about some of the types of food preservation. I guess there are mainly three major, major types. And under the canning, there's a couple other things you can do. But there's drying, and we're going to talk about drying real quick. And that's, you know, use the dehydrator and drying. And, and what kind of things do you think about drying? Do you think about when you think about dry food? Beef jerky. Yeah. Jerky. Yes. Fruits. Fruits, yeah. So you have fruits like dried apples, dried peaches, dried fruits. And also fruit leathers, too. That, that's the puree fruit and you dry. It makes like fruit leather, which commercially would be what? What do you see those sold to kids commercially? Fruit roll-ups, yeah, yeah. But but if you dry them and make them yourself, they're fruit levers. And then you've got freezing. And, of course, you can freeze a lot of stuff. And then you've got canning. And under canning, you kind of have water bath canning. We have pressure canning we talked about. But you also kind of have pickling and fermentation, even though you end up kind of canning those as well. But it's a kind of different process, okay? So we're going to kind of break down each one of those as we talk. When you talk about drying, there's, there's some ways of drying, too. You can do sun drying, you know, outside, solar, in the sun. You can do oven drying. This is where you can use your oven, and it would be safe. But that gets a little bit expensive because of the electricity that you're using and how you kind of have to keep your oven ventilated. And then you can have a dehydrator. And these are probably the easiest to use. And this is a really nice dehydrator. And if you look at it, you see how it has individual trays. See all these individual trays, and you just put your product on the tray, and you can just stack them together. And then you've got different thing, temperatures here that you can turn your fan on. And this is a top fan that so kind of circulates all the way through. When it's taking, you can kind of read your recipes as to how long to do that. Okay. You know, higher temperature, a little bit longer, maybe for jerky versus fruit, things like that. And this particular um, dehydrator, you couldn't even buy more trays. You could do up to 12. So if you're doing a quantity, I think it has one, two, three, four. It has five right now. Or you can take some out, you know, if you don't need all that many. Um, I do not know about prices on these things, to be honest. Um, I would say this was, you know, this is a really nice one. These are borrowed from the central region. We have them for, you know, different counties that are already used for teaching purposes. Um, and it didn't look like it had ever even been opened before when I opened it. Uh, but I would say it's probably a 50 or $60 food hydrator. But, you know, if you want to make a lot of jerky, you know, um, if you like to do, you know, dried fruit or fruit or oils and things like that, you know, it would be well worth it to use that, I think. Um, a lot of hunters make jerky, okay? Venison jerky, any of you guys hunters that make jerky? Yeah, I thought you might, okay? That's good. Uh, so you can do it like that. My dad used to make beef jerky all the time, and it was the best jerky. But he had to quit because... He had to go get it specialty cut uh -huh. thin enough, and the guy who did it stopped doing it, and then it got so expensive to have it cut yeah. that he just quit doing it. We were all very sad. Yeah, I bet. And, you know, you make your own recipes. You know, you do your own marinade and all mm -hmm. those different kinds of things with it. Yeah. And there are lots of different meats that people make jerky out of. Yeah. I made pemmican once, and, yeah, it took forever to cut. Oh, man. We sliced it so thin, and then I did the oven drying method. 
Uh -huh. I've only been through one time, so I don't care too much about it. the extra cost. Yeah. Having to run out to get a food bagger would cost me something too, you know. Wow. How did it turn out? It turned out okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, you just dry it until it's until you can grind it into a powder. Mm -hmm. and yeah. And then you mix that with, with uh, tallow. Mm -hmm. and it, okay. it, stays, it stays good for like 50 years or more. Oh, gosh. Wow. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and that's the thing about with your dried food, once you get through drying it, you can, you know, then often put it in a jar, like one of your mason jars or, you know, a freezer type thing to seal it and keep it, you know, airtight on your shelf and it will last a pretty good while. Um, you know, my recommendation whenever you are dehydrating stuff is you just get a good recipe and follow it. Uh, you know, there's instructions and like this dehydrator, it actually even came with some spices with it. And of course, they have little cookbooks along with their instructions of how to do it. And whatever kind of equipment you get, whether it be for drying or for candy, you really do want to read your instruction books because it's just like any other kind of equipment. You know, the company knows how it works, and that, that's important to follow that. Uh, can you dry? Is every food something that you can dry? No, not everything. Um, a lot of fruit, but we did. There are some vegetables that you can. Green beans are something that people draw. And you go, why would you use dried green beans? Well, you can have them for stews and soups and things because they reconstitute. And it's kind of, it saves some space on storage sometimes. People do that. Uh, then, you know, and I, I failed to mention that there is another drawing method that some people use, and that's on the bond for like your beans. And you just let them till they're dry, and then you shell them, and then you put those in. in, in uh, preserve those. Um, herbs dry really well too. So a lot of people dry herbs. If they don't freeze them, they dry them. So that's something you can use a lot. Okay, now let's move on to our freezing. Um, freezing is almost any food. Okay, there's just a few foods, although they have to get confusing, that you can't dry. Um, you know, cream products, you know, jello, stuff like that, you can't freeze very well. And, and I've always been told, believe it or not, I was always told you didn't do milk products, cheese, any of those kinds of things. Um, but I have um, been proven wrong. And mainly it's because my daughter lives in Alaska and they have to buy things in large quantity because it's super expensive. And she has proven me wrong. You can freeze milk and you can freeze cheese. Now you have to be careful how you thaw it. And it has to be slow and complete so it all goes back together because, you know, milk's homogenized and it will all separate. And the cheese, you got to be really careful because it gets crumbly. So the quality, you know, you have to deal with, but you can do it. So, you know, I just didn't know that. I guess it takes becoming an Eskimo to learn how to do this. <laughs> okay. Um, some of the advantages of freezing, though. It does retain its quality really well. You know, food tastes really good. It's been frozen. Uh, this is a really good texture a lot of times, you know. Uh, and if you do it correctly and quick enough, um, you know, it tastes almost like out of the field sometimes. It, it really retains a high nutrient level when you're freezing food. Um, so, like, if you're buying frozen vegetables at the grocery store, particularly out of season, you know, they're going to be just as nutritious for you. And usually you can prepare them just about any way. And I know people don't often think this, but I've even taken frozen Brussels sprouts and roasted them in the oven, just like I would roast fresh Brussels sprouts, and it works fine. And it's, a lot of times in the year, it's cheaper to buy frozen Brussels sprouts than to buy fresh ones. They can be kind of expensive. And, you know, of course, roasting tastes so much better <laughs> in my mind. But anyway, that's some advantages. Now, there can be some disadvantages, the cost of a freezer, or if you don't have a space for a freezer, and your refrigerator freezer often doesn't keep things as well for long periods of time. You probably use it for shorter periods of storage, just like a couple of months, because you get in and out of that more often. So the temperature fluctuates a little bit more. But if you have a separate freezer, like a, a fry or a chest freezer, you know, that's going to make things last a lot longer. And in all reality, yes. I was going to say, um, have you ever heard about like the... Uh... The difference between a, a freezer that has like uh, self defrosting features versus one like a chest freezer which doesn't. Uh -huh. I think what I've, what I've read is that the ones that like operate freezers uh -huh. and then the ones that are attached to our fridge, uh -huh. those won't keep the food uh, as well because they, they they do the self defrost, whereas the chest freezers will keep the food longer. 
and it will well, taste better in the end as well. Well, it is true. I don't know about the you know, the self defrost part, but it is true about the upright versus chest because the upright, when you open it, one, it doesn't store as much as a chest. And of course, it's not on top of each other, you know, because it's upright, there's those shelves, and you're opening it more. And so there's more air getting into it than with your chest as yeah. well. And and so it, can cause, it can cause like a freezer burn flavor. Yeah. The food the time. And thank you for bringing up freezer burn. Is freezer burn harmful? Yeah. It's, 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 it's a quality issue. It is not harmful. It's a quality issue. And freezer burn is basically just that loss of moisture. So it's completely right out and kind of burnt. Now, some things that are freezer burnt, like meat or something, if it's not real bad, you can just kind of cut it off and then use the rest of it and fine. Now, some things it may be burnt so bad, you know, like your bread or something like that, that it just doesn't taste good and you're just not eating, you're going to chunk it. But just because there may be a little area of freezer burn on something doesn't mean the whole thing's ruined by any means. But yes, your chest freezers usually keep things longer than your upright. Plus, they do hold more, okay? Um, yes, it's more convenient, maybe your upright, but you know, you can organize your chest one right too. Now, from all I understand, I did look the other day, I think you maybe can get it, I'm not sure, but there's been a big run on freezers, you know, with the pandemic and everybody got scared about food. And you were having to wait six months after you ordered one to get one, you know, from your big box store. Um, so if you want a freezer, you might start looking now. But, um, but you know, what are some other advantages to a freezer if you do invest in the cost of a freezer? Besides just your excess produce, any other advantages? You can save a bunch of money. If you go to the grocery yeah. store, they've got meat on sale. Yeah. Clear, clean them up. I do it every time I go. I do too. Oh, sale, you're the person that's cleaning the out the meat. Now the meat is on sale. Guess what? They all belong to me. Next day, it's the ribeyes. Now they're all mine. Yeah, yeah I do the same thing. Yeah. I buy meat in quantity when it's on sale. You know, if I um, when I get ground beef, um, I tend to get a high, you know, percentage of uh, low percentage of fat, high percentage of ground beef. I tend to get it at one of the wholesale stores. And then I get like 10 pound, two or three 10 pound bags, come home, divide it, freeze it, and then I've got my ground beef. Yes. Is it harmful to freeze that meat directly from the grocery store with no. that preservation factor in it? You know, well, no, just directly from the store, like it is. It is bad if it's if it's sealed, you can freeze it in that. It's not harmful, but it doesn't keep as well. Because that little saran wrap stuff on it, that's not very, you know, that's very coarse. Yes. Yeah, that little pad in there. Yeah, that just kind of absorbs things. I wouldn't leave that in there. But it's not harmful to you. But I just wouldn't. Um, the best thing to do when you're freezing meat that you bring home from the store is take it out of that package and put it in something that is, is more, um, less porous. It's better to freeze it. So, like, for example, freezer bags, okay, Ziploc bags, they're really good for freezing. Make sure they're freezer bags, though. You know why? Because this is a lot thicker, a lot thicker than your storage bags. You can feel it if you compare the two. And then if you're freezing, you also need to make sure that you, you know, get as much of the air out of it as you can, okay? You, know, you just have to push out the air, okay? Now, the other thing you can do with freezing, you could use this butcher paper or like the freezer paper because that's really thick too and you could rewrap around that and then you can use the freezer tape because you have to get freezer tape wherever masking tape won't work and you know wrap it really good because if you've ever had meat processed you know like if you killed a deer or something and took the meat processor it's going to come wrapped in, in freezer paper butcher paper and then they're going to be written on the outside and whatever you do whenever you do freeze something write on it, you know, you've got those little spaces to write on the paper, on this, on your packaging, whatever, write on it so that you know what you've got and when you put it in there, okay? But a lot of things, they, they, most things are, are fine in the freezer for at least a year, at least a year, and most of it's indefinitely. All that happens, it's not going to kill you by any means. It's not going to make you sick. It's just going to be the quality that's going to deteriorate. But I had a turkey that I bought that had been in the freezer, I think, for at least two and a half years. And I got that thing out and bought it and just took it out. 
maybe a month, you know. I mean, I mean, that's a little bit exaggeration. It took a long time in the refrigerator to fall that turkey out. And uh, and we had it one year for Thanksgiving. I don't think I told my family how long it'd been in the freezer. Uh, it was great. It was wonderful. There was absolutely nothing wrong with that turkey. You know, and I knew it was going to be fine, but I just knew better than tell them it had been there two and a half years. And they go, oh, I'm not eating two and a half years old turkey. You got your beat. We've got corn in our freezer from 2007. All right. Now, no one's touched it, <laughs> but it could still be good. Who it knows? Be. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. And it's definitely it's not going to hurt to try because it's not going to hurt. Yeah. Does it help to have the freezer down to like zero degrees rather than some you know, 20s or whatever? Oh, yeah, it needs to be at zero. Yeah, yeah zero, yeah. definitely. Yeah. You like to use the, the food saver, the vacuum sealer? Vacuum sealers, yeah. Let me tell you something about the vacuum sealers. I like the vacuum sealers too, and I use that a lot for the things that I do, like buying excess meat at the grocery store and right that. I use that. I also use it for leftovers. Like, you know, we make these just my husband and I now, and so we make spaghetti, and you know, that's two meals. We eat one meal, then I put the spaghetti in one and freeze it, and then I've got another meal for when I go home for my nights like this or something. Um, so yeah, that's right. But now, don't use that as a substitute for freezing your produce and stuff straight from the garden, okay? Because I was just reading an article about that. Um, you still, you know, if you're actually freezing your vegetables, you need to still blanch them, still follow the instructions, and still quick freeze them. And then you can put them in something else that would vacuum seal them, but you need to follow all those instructions, okay? And that brings me to when you're freezing vegetables and things that come out of the garden, you're going to use a blancher. Sometimes you're going to use a blancher, maybe even with drying your fruit. And sometimes you, you want to stop that deterioration process. And this is a really old blancher, okay? But they all look pretty much the same. It's just a pot with something that's got little holes in it. And so you fill that up with boiling water. You dip your stuff in it for, you know, whatever length of time your recipe says. You know, anywhere to three minutes, five minutes, and it's corn on the cob, it's big corn, it's gonna take a little longer. And then what you're gonna do with that is you're gonna have a big bowl of ice water ready to go, and you quick kill that for about the same number of minutes, usually that you blanched it. And then you're gonna take that out, you're gonna put it on a towel and get as much moisture off of it as you can, and use your paper towels and all that, you know, pat it drama, and then you're gonna quickly package it and something to freeze it. And so when you're freezing, you can use freezer containers like this. I really like this one. This is a rubber made. It's really thick. And that's what you're going to want is something that feels really sturdy and that you can keep it tight so that it's not going to get freezer burn. Okay. Um, and like we said, the freezer paper that, you know, back in the day, I don't think they do this anymore, but back in the day, they had boxes and bags and you put the bag, stuff in the bags and then you put it in the box and then you seal that bag and then you seal that box and you tape it and you wrote on it and you stack it in your freezer and it all stacked up together, okay? But now they have all these fancy containers. These are some others that say freezer, but they don't feel as thick to me as that does. So I might spend a little bit more money because the thing about it is, guys, you can reuse these, okay? Um, you know, Glass says they have freezer containers like this, but again, I probably wouldn't really use long term. You know, I might use this for leftovers. It would probably do good, you know, for a month in your refrigerator freezer, and that'd be pretty easy. But for long term, I would invest in better things. You can also use your ball jars for freezing, and they have a different cap that you can put on them that's just a nice little screw cap, and those things can freeze as well. These, this glass is safe for freezing as well as for canning. So sometimes people do that. And I think Bold or Per makes some freezer products like this too, if you go to the you know food preservation section. So those are some good tips for canning, okay? I mean for freezing, sorry. Um, also berries. Uh, Taylor and I were talking about this. I like your blueberries and stuff. You don't even need to wash your blueberries. You can just lay them flat it's on the cookie. Better if you don't wash them. Yes, better if you don't. Better if you don't. Um, just lay them flat on the cookie sheet and put them in your freezer and like quick freeze, you know, like maybe a couple hours, take them out, then loose pack them like in a Ziploc, you know, that would be heavy freezer or something, steal them, put them back in your freezer when you're ready to use them, then you wash them and then you use them in your smoothies, you use them in your pies or whatever. And Taylor has a great story, the Christmas pie that she won first place on 
It had blueberries from her freezer in it. Yeah, from Tony's farm. Yep, I, uh, I, there were, I don't know how many pies were in the contest, but I did win on my blue mixed berry pie and I used blueberries that I had frozen from July when we had gone and picked them at Tony's place. Um, but better to not wash them ahead of time. If you need to wash them, you feel like they're really dirty, that's fine. Freezing helps stop the deterioration He's process. It's better than, you know, when you go buy, I, have you seen all these like videos on people, their grocery hauls and they're organizing their fridges and they're washing all their produce? Some produce is okay to go wash ahead of time, but a lot of your berries and stuff, don't wash them until you're ready to eat them because when you wet them, they start to break down. They start to get mold. They start to do things like that. So it's better if you hold off on the washing till you're ready to use them. And so when I packed those berries, I just put them in a freezer bag, put them up. And when I got ready to cook with them, I washed them off and put them in my pie and I won. She was okay. she was <laughs> I was very, very surprised. It was one ugly looking pie. <laughs> it was not a beauty contest. Oh, but it tasted good. It, tasted good. <laughs> it, it was a good pie. Um, the thing is that with berries, I think berries often, you know, about the only way you really can berries successfully in my mind is to make them into like a jelly or a jam or something like that. But, you know, if you're just wanting to use berries, I think freezing is a better way to go, like your frozen strawberries, you know. Now, some of your freezing fruit, like peaches, you do it in a syrup pack. And it still preserves it, but that and that partially helps with the deterioration of the peaches and the discoloration and all. And and there's all sorts of different like white syrup, heavy syrup, you know, neck, you know, you can use juice and things like that. And you just need to follow your recipes on that. And we're going to talk about where you get good recipes in a little bit. So moving on to your canning. Now you've decided that there's some things you just really want to can. And this is a water bath canner. And you'll see it's a big old thing, right? And then in the bottom, it has a tray, you know, that you have to, because you don't just put your jars on the bottom, okay? Because they're liable to break. So you have to make sure this is sitting in, and then you fill it full of water, and you get to a certain temperature, and then you, you put, get your jars all ready, and then you set them in, and, you know, you've got all those things. And, of course, you have a jar lifter for how you can take them out, you know, and you're wanting to keep them straight and not want to tilt and all that kind of stuff. Okay, now this is one con, and this is another con. And I think this is a really interesting thing. Again, this was something the Central Region had um, because can you uh, do canning on just any kind of stove? Yeah. No. What about all these nice new glass top, ceramic top, flat top stoves? No. No, you can't do that. And why? Because look how big this thing is. It's really heavy, okay? And you're going to have that burner on for a long period of time, and this thing's going to get heavy and hot and boiling, and it can crack that nice new cooktop. And most of your um, manufacturers will not guarantee that they will replace it if you can on it. Now, I just got a new cooktop, and I was reading about it, and it did say on one burner, you might could, but it was kind of a might. And I thought, nah, nah, not, not as much as I just paid for this new cooktop. I don't think so. Um, I know people who really love to can, and you may do this. They have a stove in their basement, and that's what they can on. You know, it's just a regular four burner stove that they can on. It's their can stove. Can you do open kettle canning, or can you do it outside with a gas burner? Or something. Can you do that? Don't do that. Please don't do that. Don't decide you're going to go outside and fire up the grill and I'm going to put my can on it. No, don't do that. Why? Because it's not safe and you can't keep the temperature even. Okay? Can't keep your temperature even. And on a gas stove, gas stove can work great, but be careful about a gas stove because I had a gas stove in the other house I lived in and I still couldn't can because there was a vent over it. And when it got a certain temperature, the vent came on. And that way you couldn't keep the temperature even. And we were having a canning class in cooking kitchens, kitchens at MTSU. And we had that problem in one of the stoves because it was gas and, and a fan was coming on. So you know, you've got to keep that even temperature. And this was a kitchen you know, was designed for you know teaching in. So you, you've got to be careful about that. Yes, ma'am. So I'm a little bit confused because you said don't get this time at thoughts. Gas stove 
stove do you use? Well, you can't use a gas stove. It's just if you have a microwave right over it. Oh, that's what you're talking about. That's what I was talking about. Because, you know, a lot of times in your house, you have the stove and the microwave over it. And, of course, it has a protection level on that microwave, so it doesn't get too hot. But then that fan comes up. Yeah, you could use a regular gas stove. Yeah. And a lot of people, a regular four burner stove, a regular eye, what, what do you call those eyes? So, you know, the elements. Little, the little elements. You know, those little elements, a regular element on a regular stove. Yeah. I do have a new one. Uh huh. This might be called a ceramic. I'm not sure if it's ceramic stuff or burner. Okay. But I have a very large burner. A very large burner. For years, I've been hanging on it and not touching it. Yeah, and they do make them. Yeah. I, they do make them because I had a, um, another lady that I worked with. Who told me she was getting her kitchen redone and she made sure she got a stove that had what they called a canning burner it was a very large burner but see that's another thing you just heard her say it had a large burner you know a lot of your eyes would not fit this and so you couldn't keep your heat even if it wasn't over the whole burner right okay so that's something else to think about but why i was going to tell you about this if you want water bath canner i thought this was pretty cool because it's freestanding and it's um, it's it's separate. But we can't hear you, Patsy. You have to hold it. Sorry. I waited. You see that this this comes off, and see it's just a little thing on the bottom that you. It's just a little um heater on the bottom, and you plug it in, and then you put this on top of it, and it gets hot enough that you can can in it. Now this can also be used for pasta and soups. And um, again, this was something new from the Central Region office. So I had kind of fun reading about it today. Um, they give you soup recipes and how to make chicken stock, but they tell you not to can them in this because your soups and your stews, what did I say earlier? They should be pressure canned, right? They shouldn't be water bath. And they said, when you make the chicken stock, this makes a nice big pot of chicken stock. And then they suggest you freeze the chicken stock. Mm -hmm. take over now. Thank you. So. I thought this was pretty cool. I don't know how much this is, but I thought it was pretty cool. Yes. Is that a little streak on the side so you can get yourself a glass of warm chicken stock? Well, mm, yes. It's also it's yes. also so you can make hot beverages like mold cider and things. Sounds a little more like appetizing. That. Yeah, so you can do some things with that. Yeah. And then I guess it would give you a way to inky out your water. You know? But yeah, and it has to, it has a thing in it again. Okay. You have to have something on the bottom, and it has one of those racks on the bottom, like they all do. Again, don't touch the bottom with your glasses, okay, and with your glass jars. And then it can also be a steamer, so you can steam stuff in it. And this is a just lamp, but they said when you're canning, you put this on top, and it helps keep all the steam in for a healthy temperature. But anyway, I thought it was kind of a cool thing. Um, now, again, you would have to have a place to store it, because I don't think you want this sitting on your kitchen counter right but it's pretty cool um and then we've got two kinds of pressure canners okay and i want you to see the difference this one is digital okay and this one is weighted and there's not one's not better than the other they're just different okay and if you're pressure canning you know you can read it right here on this dial gauge and you know you usually want to get to 11 pounds that's what most things around here are um if you're using weighted you've got a five a 10 and a 15 and, and depending on what hole you put it in as to what weight it is. Most things are around 10, but there are some things that might be five. And of course, depending on your altitude is when you get higher, that 15 and all that, but we're not that high here, okay? Um, people talk about having their pressure canner tested every year, okay? And this is a tester, so I, didn't, you know, I know you wonder what the full deal is. This is a tester. And so people would bring in their little gauge here and they would put it on here and I would do this little bicycle pump thing and get it up. I send this off to be tested. So I would get this up to a certain pressure like 10 or 11. And then I'd look to make sure they're said 10 or 11. And then we have a little guy that if theirs is a pound or two off, we can tell them how to still use it and adjust their cooking time. But if it's more than a pound or two, one way or the other, we tell them they need to get a new gauge, okay? And, uh, Why would it wrong. need to be tested? What would happen if it was wrong? If it were wrong, you wouldn't be you wouldn't know that your food was safe because you would not be sure that you were using your it wouldn't be getting hot enough or pressurized enough to get all the germs killed. That makes sense. How dangerous is pressure 
do it right, it's not that dangerous. <laughs> um, and, and actually, I don't think it's that dangerous anymore. I know people used to talk about blowing up and all, and that was more of the smaller pressure cookers that people used to use. But, you know, nowadays, you know, these have got a lot of safety things on, they lock. You know, this has a valve, and you, you won't even unlock to the pressure's gone all the way down. You know, they've got an escape valve, too. Um, you know, this one's got one too. I know I was teaching a class. I know we can't do hands on here because we don't have a big enough facility, you know, kitchen to do it. But I was doing one one time at a church kitchen, and you know, we had two or three things going, and it took so long. It was really a long class because you just couldn't even get anything open till it was done. I mean, till, I mean, you know, it was safe, you know, because you were not going to be able to accidentally open this before you had to. So. It's pretty safe now. I've almost singed my eyebrows off on one of those ninja foodies and accidentally top opening the thing. Yeah. yeah. You got to be careful yeah. singing those Instapot things now with the steam. If you open that up towards you, you know, you are that little valve and you're in the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that doesn't feel very good. And that's another question. You cannot can an Instapot, okay? You can't can. Some companies are trying to sell these multi cookers and tell you you can can on your countertop and you can't so don't do that there are a few that are small like this maybe for jams and jellies and if you just want to make a few jars you could of that uh, because jams and jellies are a little bit safer too because they're highly acidic but yeah you don't want to but don't 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 buy that oh this does everything no it doesn't there's not any one appliance that does everything really okay um questions you may have questions comments other things? Do you, oh, yes. Do you have any idea how many people die each year from It's very rare. Well, it probably is very rare, but you know, I, I happen to like fruit, but a lot of people like candy. But um, I think candy is a lot of work personally. And I tell you why I got kind of scared about it is because our specialist at Teats, she's candy. She has told us several stories of people who died from different things. And um, and there was an outbreak in a church potluck and somebody's potatoes that had been canned and stuff. And so it just kind of like, I, I don't know, you know. But I will tell you, most likely, most canning is very safe. But what I would do, what I really want to encourage you with canning is be sure you follow the directions. And so that, we all let into that. This book called So Easy to Preserve, is what we call the Bible of food preservation, okay? And, um, and y'all can look at it, and I've got some handouts for you where you can get it. Uh, it is put out by the Georgia Education, uh, Extension Education. They have the Center for Home Food Preservation, which, where's my handout? Why don't you uh, take one of these and pass them around? Because on the back of this, handout is the website for the Center for Home for Food Preservation, and, and they got money from USDA for a while, and so they did a lot of the testing of the recipes, and, and their website just has a tremendous amount of information about any kind of food preservation you want to do. Everything from fermenting, from pickling, to, you know, canning, uh, drying, whatever you want. They just have everything you might want, and it's on the back of their website. And they do sell that book there, so easy to preserve. It's now $25, uh, so if you want a copy. But they will answer your questions. A lot of the stuff is just there online that you can still read and find what page you want online. There is also another book, um, and this book is from the USDA about home canning, and it also has recipes. And you can get this book um, usually from Purdue, or you can go online, and you don't even have to purchase it. And you can just print out the page you want online, and I'll pass this around if you want to look at it. And the website for that is also on the back of that little thing that I gave you. And uh, and the, the, you know, so you can really go by the USDA tested recipes. Now your ball and curd jars, I would you know I trust theirs. Theirs are trusted recipes. And and when we we're talking about these jars, I failed to tell you this. You can see how these are tempered. And a real candy jar is going to have like mason or ball or pearl or curve, KDR or something like that on it. It's going to have these ridges. You're going to know that it's a good candy jar. 
Now, they have been a few off brands that have come out in the last couple of years because candy jars got pretty scarce one year. And I think Walmart had a brand and somebody else had some coming from China that maybe were at the Dollar General store or somewhere. Um, I wouldn't trust those. I really wouldn't because we don't know if they're really, you know, the kind of plastic. You don't want to go to all that work and put it in your can or anything breaks because then you can't use it. Yes. Can you repeat the question? He wanted to know how many years you would use a jar before you would not use it anymore. Um, I would say indefinitely, as long as it's no cracks or chips or anything. Yeah, when the bottom cracks out, you got to get rid of it. <laughs> but, you know, I would say they should be good for at least five or six years for sure, if not longer. But now I will tell you this don't go for the antique jars. Because, you know, if it's a jar that's in great grandma's house, you don't know about that jar, okay? So I'd stay within the last 20, 25 years on your jars, okay? And this is a quart jar, and it's just your average, you know, mouth and seal. And this is also a quart jar, but this is what we call a wide mouth, okay? So your wide mouth just might be for larger things. It was easier for you to get into the jar, okay? And then you've got your, your little uh, half pint jar here, and it's a regular, you know, mouth jar. But you've also got a wide mouth here. And then, of course, you can buy these jelly jars, too, that people use. And they come decorative, and they come a lot of fancy ways because people use them for gifting. And there's even some little smaller ones than that. I mean, they're just really little bitty jars. But still make sure that they are a true candy jar. And even those little bitty jars that you do for jelly, you don't think that you can cut down the time, okay? If you don't find the size jar that you have, you go for the closest thing to it. And if the closest thing was a half a pint, then you process it like a half a pint. You know, don't, don't say, oh, well, that's about half, so I'm going to cut it down by half. Don't do that, okay? And I see you agreeing with me. Yeah. You'd rather over-process than under-process, okay? And, um, and then with your lids, um, you can reuse these rings as long as they're not rusty. This one, these are things I've collected over the years from the fair, but this one you see is getting rusty inside, so I'd probably discard that. But these, um, your rings, but now your lids, one time use only, one time use only because this rubber seal is what makes that vacuum seal, and once you pop that, you can't use that again. Now, you know, if you wanted to use the lid, I guess just to you know, store something in your pantry, you know, some dry good or something, so it's closed. That's a different story, but anything you're actually can. And there are some, um, and somebody said, what if I had lids that I didn't use that were left from last year? Well, as long as the rubber's still intact and you never used them, they should be okay. Now, I wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't like, if, again, if, you know, grandma or somebody died and you found a box of, of these lids that had been there for 10 years or so, I wouldn't use them because the rubber just might have disintegrated. You know, rubber doesn't keep forever, even if you don't use it. Yes? Uh, just a little bit ago, you mentioned fermenting. Uh-huh, fermenting. Yeah, you, you, you want me to go over fermenting a little bit? Yeah, that's good. Fermenting is a process that you're usually using like a brine or you're using vinegar or some other things with fermenting. And uh, fermenting is something you do like in crock pots. Let me kind of look at my notes a second to tell you a little bit more about it because I don't ferment on a regular basis by any means, but, but, I, but I do know what you do about it. Um, when you're fermenting with your food, you are. Does anybody in here ferment? Yeah, who does ferment? Do you ferment? It turned out horrible. It, it, it's like a curing process. What do you ferment? Oh yeah, man. Sauerkraut. Yeah, that was the thing I was reading about today with the sauerkraut. And we did do some in class. You usually use a lot of salt with it. It's very high in sodium. Uh, and you use like a pickling or canning salt. Don't use iodized salt because the iodine is a problem. You don't want to do that. Um, when you're fermenting, it kind of facilitates that extraction of the nutrients and it stops the growth of those microorganisms. And then the salt also is a flavor ingredient. Um, you use large star stoneware crocks, large glass jars, or food grade plastic containers. See, not just your cheap plastic that you go get wherever, but your food grade. 
and you don't use any kind of copper, brass, galvanized, or iron utensils because you don't want to do that with brine. That's not good. Uh, then once you've got your sauerkraut ready, what do you do with yours after you get it ready? You bury it. Okay. Yeah, I know people bury it. Uh, but they say it freezes well. It'll keep in the refrigerator for up to six months. It'll freeze indefinitely. Um, you know, long-term storage, they really recommend canning it for long-term. And, you know, then you, and that would destroy. But the only thing about doing that, the thing you've got to watch if you want to can it, is that's going to destroy some of your probiotic properties. That you wanted from your fermentation, you know. So, so yeah, yeah. I know people that bury it. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you can. I've made sauerkraut in college. That was like our fermenting in in class. And every week we come down and we press more in there, yeah. and then we come back and we press more in there. And I will say, it put me off of sauerkraut for a while because that was a gross thing. I it just, is. If you keep it, pressing it for about five or six weeks, that you do that. And then when you're watching those bubbles come out, you know it, it, it's going. But you've got to get all that juice and all that liquid out and all. Yeah, it, it's quite a process for sure. How long do you bury it? Someone asked. Three months or so. In the yard. Like treasure. Yeah, you just make like a little cave. So if we came to your property, we wouldn't be finding gold necessarily. We'd be digging up sauerkraut. That's, okay. That's pretty interesting to bury it. Yeah, that's great. And uh, isn't kimchi, isn't that kind of the same thing yeah. in Korea? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I thought they bury it a lot of times too. I love them both. I just don't ever want to make them. So yeah, I'll let you do I that. <laughs> My favorite thing to make are refrigerator pickles. I like the easy process. I like... That, I know it doesn't last long, but I love a good refrigerator pickle. Yeah, that way you just and you can't keep those a long time because they're just in your refrigerator. But pickling, that brings another thing. You, you can pickle like cucumbers, but you can also do other vegetables like squash pickles, okay? And fruit like peach pickles and beets, you know, beet pickles. I think. And again, with pickles, that's like a salt and a vinegar and then usually some kind of sweetener and some spices or herbs and water and then a firming agent. You know, to make them so they don't get all mushy and yucky. And then um, also, usually, if you do a lot of things together, you know, you make a chop it up, make a relish, and that's pickled or a chutney. Chow, chow. Chow, chow. Mm -hmm. um, the pickles, when they're, if they get fermented, if the pickles get fermented, which you can ferment them too, they produce lactic acid. And then you usually add vinegar to these pickles to make them very acidic. But then once you're done with those pickles, you do water bath, can those. I like pickled okra. Yes, oh, I forgot you do okra too. Yeah. Okra. You'll see all these interesting pickled things at the fair. Yes. So I, I got a gift like a year ago, Christmas. Um, uh -huh. Pickled, canned, pickled, spicy, spicy pickled. Uh -huh. How long are those going to last? You got them a year ago? Oh, yeah. Okay. They're in the fridge. Oh, they're in the fridge. And they were canned. They're not like refrigerator pickles. They're, they're in a jar, yeah. They're sealed, right? Sealed. Okay. Well, they're probably okay, but I wouldn't wait much longer. Yeah, but it's going to be 18 months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, our recommendation on canned goods is a year. After, the, after that, the quality begins to deteriorate. Um, so sometimes they, you know, don't stay the same color. They're not as firm. You know, the taste might not be as good. So you want to kind of use. So people who do a lot of canned goods, that's the idea. I mean, when the new produce comes in, get your old up so you can start using that first and let your, you know, keep it rotated. You know, don't put your new in front of it. So, but now I tell you, again, if you end up at grandma's house down in her cellar somewhere and you find a bunch of canned goods, I would not be eating those. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Canned meat about the same for a year. Yeah, about the same. Uh, the other thing we're going to do that to find in, in your grandma's kitchen. Expired things, because that's what we do when we go to my parents' house. We, it's like a competition. Who can find the most expired, expired thing, something? Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, yeah, we get rid of it. Yeah, my dad might eat it, but. Well, you know, again, the deterioration just goes down on that kind of stuff, you know. But now you can also buy, like, you know, kits and things, you know, little spices and things and things to help you with making your pickles and stuff. 
Um, I have this one recipe and it's been the best recipe that's worked for me for refrigerator pickles. Again, I don't can, but it had grape leaves in it. And something about, and I don't know if anybody has ever, what it is about grape leaves, but after we use that, I started real seeing it in more and more rest pickling recipes. And I wonder what the property of the grape leaves are that make it integral to pickling. I don't, does anybody? I don't know that either. I've never heard that. I make a lot of pickles and I see it frequently. Yeah. I'll, I'll see it. It's not a flavor it's thing. It's a, it's, I, I, I don't think know. It, I think it might serve as a fermenting. Yeah. I was wondering, did they have a farming product? Maybe. Product? Okay, yeah. Uh, there are some beauty mm -hmm. products that use yeah. grape. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah, well, all the good ones I've had, I've had grape leaves in them, so who knows? All right, I also have the UT put out a little canning booth that's kind of a part of that USDA canning. I have enough up here for you to get one. And um, I also have a little freezing book that you're welcome to get, okay? Any questions? Okay, I would like you to take those. Yes. Honey? Honey, honey lasts forever. Yeah. Jasmine, that's about the uh, pressure canners. The, the one that doesn't have the dial, that one doesn't need to be, be uh, tested. No, no, nothing being tested. It's yeah. just a way. So it, it's kind of superior in that sense, but it, it rattles a lot. Though. But it rattles, <laughs> and you've got to watch to make sure it's walking right and keeps walking yeah. all the time. Whereas you can look at that and make sure your gauge is staying steady. So I guess it's just what you prefer. Any questions on Zoom? Someone says they do kimchi, sauerkraut, and pickles. Okay. They are way into fermentation. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Just, just on the cousins, you can do a lot of pickles. They will have the capacity if you have the best sweet and spicy. Oh, I love a good sweet and spicy. Oh, okay. Sweet and spicy pickle recipe. He said Emerald Lagasse. Famous awesome. chef. I love a good, have you had, um, oh, what's my favorite? Wickles pickles? These are better. Are they? I'm from Alabama, so Wickles pickles is a, yeah, that was your standard to go by? Okay, I'll have to look it up. Okay. Yeah. I haven't met a pickle I don't like. I love, good oh, yeah. I love vinegar, anything vinegary. Oh, so, you, so you would like all the fermentation oh, yeah. and pickling and all? Not maybe not the process, but the eating, yes. Well, yeah, yeah, you don't have to like the process. <laughs> like the eating, the any other questions? Any other comments? Okay. Mm -hmm. Be sure you do. If you didn't get one, be sure you do. Yes. For people because, on Zoom. Just because it is. And I'll, 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 we'll, it. I'll have these and bring we'll them next the class. It, well, actually, something, if anybody's hot, um, I'm going to talk a little bit on seed saving. So don't hop off Zoom just yet. But next week for y'all here and y'all on Zoom, it will be all virtual next week. So we won't be here in person. It'll be an all virtual class. Okay. Because this kind of gives you some idea of freezing, canning, and drying if you kind of want to decide. But I really think those websites on the back are super important. Um, what you might know, just real quick too, is if you go to other extension websites, you can trust those websites. Any extension with the EDU at the end, any of those EDU or you can trust. And like North Dakota, because this little fact in this test came from North Dakota. You know, those people up there, they hunt a lot more. So they've got a lot more information on their website about canning meat and stuff because they do preserve that a lot more than we do here in Tennessee. So, you know, when you go to some different states, you may find a lot more reliable information about certain things that are not necessarily native to us. Okay. Thank you, Patsy. That was wonderful. Appreciate If you have questions for Patsy, I can also give her you her information. I just like with Doug, um, they are here at our office. So if you want to contact them, they're happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, and we will be giving, I'll be emailing out the recap with these publications that she talked about and some of the things that I'm going to talk about. And for those on Zoom, those books, Patsy's more than happy to get rid of them. So I'll keep some copies on me. If you didn't get one, you can grab one at the next time we meet together. Oh, and let me turn this off so people can see me. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit on seed saving. Very short. We only have a little bit of time left. But I have given three handouts to the people here. Sorry, people on Zoom. Um, I do not have a handout for y'all, but I will email this to y'all. 
uh, in our, make sure my camera's going where I want it to, so you can see my face. Here we are. All right, so I will email this all out. The first handout I'm gonna talk about is Tennessee Vegetable Garden. This is literally the first page of like a 10 page document. Sorry, it's too expensive to print out the whole thing for all of y'all. We love you, maybe not that much. Um, just kidding. But you can find it online. It is a PDF uh, publication. But on here, the first page, it's going to have a calendar and it's also going to have a little chart you can see. And on that chart, it talks about what grows best from seed and transplant. So I'm gonna talk just a, just a short bit on seed saving, but this is something important to think about as we're going into the growing season. What grows best from seed and what grows best from transplant? Because if we wanna to plant tomato seeds and we want a specific variety, we wanna have already started those and gotten in the process of starting those seeds. So they'll be ready come time to plant after frost. Because tomatoes, if you look on this list here, grow best from, does it say? Transplant. So tomatoes do not grow well from direct seeding into the ground. And you may have tried to grow tomatoes that way. They just do not do well that way. They may grow and you'll get volunteers here and there when you have old fruit drop on the ground. Um, but they grow best from seed. Most of our nightshade family plants grow best, I'm sorry, from transplant. Uh, beans are cucurbits like our melons, watermelons, uh, any of our cucumbers, they grow well from seed. So you can think about saving your seeds come the end of the growing season to plant for the next year. Does anybody do any seed saving? Okay, one person, awesome. Anybody would like to save seeds? Few, okay. So with seed saving, what do you think is the most important, one of the most important things to think about when saving seeds? Right conditions, yes, that's important. When do we harvest them? It's different for every plant, but usually it's when those fruits reach maturity. So we're letting our tomatoes sit on that vine until it's mature, fully mature, not rotting, but fully mature, almost to the stage of rotting. We're letting those bean pods dry up before we get the beans out of there. That way we know that those seeds are fully mature. They've reached their mature stage and we can harvest them. So that's important when to harvest them, how to harvest them. But one of the most important things to think about is pollination. Okay. With pollination, some of the issues we run across is with plants that are cross pollinated. A lot of times with plants that cross pollinate, which are plants that have separate male and female flowers. Can anybody think of a plant that has separate male and female flowers? Elderberries. Pecans. Yes. Well, pecans are, the, they do cross pollinate. It's not necessarily certain male and female flowers, but they do cross pollinate. Vegetables. What if you can think of one? No. Peppers. No. Our pumpkins one? The cucurbit family is one. The pumpkin, melon, cucumber family. If you've ever seen it, what you'll notice is a big yellow flower and then a smaller yellow flower on the same plant that actually has a fruit sitting right behind it. Okay, so what happens is, is those fruits get pollinated when a bee usually comes to the male flower and then visits the female flower. The problem with that is you can't control where that bee's going other than that plant. It's really hard for a homeowner to control that. So you may not get the fruit that you thought you were gonna get when you harvest those seeds. So when we're looking at saving seeds, we need to look at plants that are what we call open pollinated. And just open pollinated basically means is they may get pollen from one source or another, but it's not gonna change what that parent fruit is, the most important features of that fruit. Heirlooms, those are our open pollinated plants. So when we're saving seeds, mostly from heirlooms, that's where we wanna look at getting our seed sources. Things like hybrid plants, they have been bred, crossbred uh, with two inbred varieties basically, but they've been crossbred to get very specific traits. And that seed we get off of that fruit is not gonna have the same traits as the parent because those have been engineered 
whether it's through hand pollination or tissue culture or cross pollination in the lab setting. So when we're looking at saving seeds, it's really important to look at what varieties we're taking those seeds from and try to choose things like heirlooms. Most all of our corn is hybrid. So you really have to look carefully at the seed labels and look at what you're growing to know if you've got a variety you can actually save the seed from. A lot of our fruits and vegetables have been bred to be sterile. So those seeds that they produce actually won't produce fruit. So knowing what you have, and GMO is not the same thing as hybrid. They are different things. Um, so if it says it's non-GMO, doesn't mean that it may not be hybrid. Or if it says it's GMO, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a hybrid either. They're not the same thing. Um, hybrid can just mean cross-pollination, or someone's taking pollen from one and putting it on another. So when you're harvesting seeds and saving seeds, this handout here talks a little bit more about hybrids and how vegetables are pollinated, okay? So self-pollinated vegetables, tomatoes are self-pollinated, are nightshade family. So that means that usually they, they have a, what we call a complete flower. The male and female are on the same flower. So usually almost even before they open up, they've been pollinated. They don't really need us. Okay, bees will sometimes help along the way, especially bees like bumblebees that kind of fumble along and not pollen here and there. Um, you can also, if you're having trouble with pollination, hand pollinate. Get out there with a brush and move pollen from one uh, flower to another if you want. But most of these on here will do it themselves without help from us or from any poll outside pollinators. Uh, some of our uh, crops like corn are wind pollinated. So that's why we plant them in blocks rather than long rows just like instead of having one row of corn, it's better to have a block of corn. Has anybody ever read that? It's for wind pollination because they're not pollinated by bees or anything else like that. It's the wind that pollinates it. If you're worried about cross pollinating, have you ever seen someone put a bag over? Anybody seen that? They put bags over either the flowers or over the tassels. It's so that they don't get cross pollination. They've already been pollinated and they don't want more coming in from somewhere else. Unfortunately, for homeowners, there are ways you can mitigate that, but they're usually too extreme for us or anybody that's got, you know, a smaller patch of land that they're growing on. Because you have to either distance your plants a mile away, or you have to contain it completely. So bagging the flowers can help with avoiding cross-pollination. So when we're saving seeds, that's something important to remember is pollination. And like I said, this one here talks a little bit more about that. Um, another thing to think about is how we're going to harvest it. Certain fruits and vegetables require different types of harvesting methods. For beans, like we talked about, drying. If there's a storm coming and you haven't already harvested what you need to, you can always cut the plant off or pull it up and go hang it in your garage until it fully dries and it's ready to harvest. Okay, it's fully mature, it's fully dried out. Um, plants like tomatoes, and I was going to try to do a tomato um, little demonstration with y'all on saving tomato seeds, um, but it's really hard to find heirloom tomatoes this time of year. Surprisingly, you guys, um, even the grocery stores didn't have very many of them. So I'm going to be having a seed saving class this fall uh, when it's actually a better time to harvest seeds, and y'all are more than welcome. I'll send y'all the information on that, and y'all are more than welcome to attend. We're going to hopefully have some seed exchange going on as well. That's always fun. Um, but with tomatoes, it's a fermentation process because tomatoes, their seeds are covered in that sticky goo, right? And that goo is inhibiting germination. That's, it's, that's what it does. So let's say an old tomato falls off a plant. How do we get that new plant in the spring? It's because microbes in the soil have broken down and basically it's fermented and taken that goo, that gelatinous substance off of the seed to inhibit that's inhibiting germination. Sorry, I walked away from the computer and I can't see anymore. Um, so with tomatoes, it's a fermentation process. So we're taking those seeds and we're putting them in a jar, putting it in water. We're letting it sit. We're stirring it every once in a while until it is fermented and all that goo has come off. The good seeds fall to the bottom. Everything else floats to the top. And that's how you get those tomato seeds out. And then you can lay them out and dry them. And I would be careful, sometimes they're still a little sticky, so if you put them on a piece, uh, put them on a paper plate, sometimes you rip up some paper with them uh, when you're doing that. It's not gonna hurt anything. Um, it just doesn't make storing as nice. So with tomatoes, that's a fermentation process. So 
some of our other fruits and vegetables are hard to get um, seeds out of, like eggplant, very small seeds. Does anybody have a way that they get the seeds out of those? Use a grater. You can grate, you're not gonna hurt anything. You can grate it on a large grate um, and then put it in a jar of water, same thing. And what doesn't isn't good is gonna float to the top and the good seeds are gonna drop to the bottom. And you can pull out the good seeds and let them dry out. Uh, there's another process called winnowing. And it's a little more complicated, but have you ever seen people separate the chaff from seed? It's using the wind. So it's some of our seeds have a lot of fluff on them. And they have a chaff around the seed, the actual seed. And to get it off, what they do is they take it in like say a bucket and they have a fan going or they do it on a breezy day and they pour. And the seeds are heavier than the chaff. And so the wind blows the chaff off and the seeds drop down. And so you can separate it using wind or a fan and get those seeds to come out and harvest those easier than trying to pull it all the way by, by hand. So that's another way to do it. And then there's sieving, where you can sieve the seeds out in a fine mesh or just a window screen or something like that and sieve out the seeds. Most of our flowers, at the end of the season, you'll see the seeds as they mature on there. Once those petals have fallen off, it's a good time you can come and collect those seeds. When you're storing seeds, where do, where do y'all store your seeds? In my tin box, that's where I put mine. Where do y'all put yours, in the tin box? Yeah, yeah. Cool, dry, and dark. Those are the only requirements for storing seeds. Putting them in the freezer is not going to help anything. Freezers fluctuate with temperatures, as we've talked about. And they sometimes will go through a thawing process. Um, moisture is a real issue in freezers. The last thing we want is to get these seeds wet. You don't actually need sunlight for germination. Some helps, but what you need for germination is temperature and wet, okay? So that initially starts the process. So if your seeds get wet and the temperatures get warm enough, they're gonna try to germinate on you. So somewhere cool, dark, and dry is the best place. You can put them in the fridge if you want. I usually like basement, a garage, uh, somewhere that is maybe temperature controlled to some extent, and somewhere that's dry. Mm -hmm. Well, you say dry, but it's terribly humid. I know. I mean, it, as dry as you get inside, inside is better than in your garage when we're humid. Yeah. Right. Or maybe in the basement. Yeah. Oh, well, and then some people may have a temperature control basement. Yeah. But yeah, it, in a, as dry as you can be. Unfortunately, I mean, there's always going to be the issues. And I mean, our humidity, unless your seeds get really wet, they're not going to try to germinate germinate on you with just a little bit of humidity. And hopefully you got them sealed. I keep mine, for the most part when I do it, I keep mine in a plastic baggie. You can also keep them in little paper ones if you want. Uh, I keep mine in this tin where it's dark and dry and I stick it in a cabinet or my son pulls it out and starts playing with it and dumps all my seeds everywhere, which is what happened this year. I lost a lot of my seeds. but. Uh, making sure you take good notes because they do have a lifespan. If you look on this sheet that I gave you, it talks about how long these seeds last. Some last longer than others. And y'all, again, I'll send this to you. But if you look at it, expected storage life for onions, one to two years, parsnip, one to two years. Um, really, most all of these on here, it's five years or less. That doesn't mean that if I harvest it now, it's going to germinate the same percentage in five years. Each year, your germination percentages go down. But that means that majority of the seeds come five years will try to germinate. Each time you buy seeds, I think I've got an example here, should be buying them from a reputable source. I like places like Johnny Seeds. Um, Baker Creek is a real good one if you like heirlooms, or they're called rare seeds as well. Um, there's a lot of good places to get seeds from, but they should have on their germination percentage. This one is Celosia, it's a flower, and I can see on here that they tested this in 2018. So, yes, that was a while ago. Um, I have not had a place to plant these in a long time, uh, but at that time, the germination percentage was 96%. 
So when I planted these seeds, 96% of them should germinate. Well, we're about four or so years on from that. So I am not expecting 96% germination from these. Each year, your germination percentages go down. So when you buy seeds, you can look at things like that. Make sure if you're harvesting seeds, you're putting the year on there. So you know you can keep track of when you harvest those seeds so you don't get too disappointed when you only have about 50% germination. Questions? So just quick cut and dry things to think about when harvesting and saving seeds. Any questions? Oh, I've got a great book. Sorry, you guys. If you're really interested in starting and saving seeds, this is literally called Starting and Saving Seeds. Um, it's a great book. Um, goes through all the different kinds of plants you can think of, flowers, vegetables, fruits, how to save those seeds, but also how to start them. Um, temperatures for germination, light sources, how what kind of lights you need for germination. Um, it also goes through and shows you pictures of the process of fermenting tomato seeds and winnowing and separating the chaff and all that good stuff. So this is a really good one. You can come take a look at it. But if you really want to start saving your seeds or if you want to start growing from seeds, this is a good book. We also have a lot of great publications on that as well. All right. Hey, yes. Another, another good place to get heirloom seeds from is So True Seed. Yes, So True Seed. Mm -hmm. Then, and then there was one more someone mentioned to me the other day that I had not heard of. I think they're out of Virginia and I cannot remember their name. I'll think on it. No, or were they in? Somewhere in the Southeast, but there's another one. And if I think of it, I'll put it in our email list, but so true seeds. Send me a message on that so I can include it in our chat email. So if you're interested in heirloom seeds, uh, those are good places to go. All right, so that's preserving the harvest, whether you're saving seeds or you're preserving the food that you're growing and eating it later on or giving it as a gift or having fun with your family. Um, any questions? Questions on Zoom? Is the seed company in Virginia that is very good? Oh, Southern Seed Exposure, thank you. That is what I was trying to think of. Someone on Zoom, Southern Seed Exposure is another good one. Thank you so much, Justine. All right. If you don't have any questions, we really appreciate y'all being here tonight. Um, next week, again, we will be strictly virtual. I'll send a recap with a reminder, but we will be on Zoom for that one. It'll be on taxes. Yes. Get excited. We're all going to do our taxes together, right? All right. Well, thank y'all. Y'all have a good night. Thank you on Zoom.